What an honor it is to welcome you to the second annual Dr. Clifford D. Baptiste Frederick Douglass Institute Lecture Series. I'm Dr. Tracy Robinson and I serve as the university's Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer. On behalf of President Chris Fiorentino, the university's 15th president, I'd like to welcome you to Westchester. President Fiorentino could not be with us this afternoon because he is attending a Council of Trustees meeting but under his leadership, Westchester continues to actively work to be a national leader of inclusive excellence in higher education. This is accomplished by leveraging the scholarship and activities within the university with the relationships and partnerships within our community. Today is a great example of that. We are so proud to be such a distinct campus as it relates to our relationship and engagement with Frederick Douglass a legacy that continues to inform important conversations today. Westchester continues to rise in its prestige academically, as well as in its development of off-campus and academic centers, including our Philadelphia campus, as well as the community and Commonwealth partnerships. If this is your first visit to our campus, we hope it will not be your last. For students, faculty, staff, and visitors, we encourage you to continuously use this unique space to sit and reflect with Douglas, recognizing in the spirit of Sankofa, there are times we must go back to our past in order to reflect on our futures. Today marks a special occasion as the university is also celebrating its sesquicentennial through year-long programming. A reflection of the university's history would be incomplete without recognizing the challenges of both the past and the present that require redressing in order to ensure a more promising future. This is the fourth event in our 150th anniversary diversity speaker series. The theme of the series is conversations to shape a more inclusive future. We have an opportunity today to step outside of our classrooms and merge the critical reflections, thoughts, and efforts of Frederick Douglass with what we need to understand today as we live our lives built on inspiration, on hope, on activism, on faith, and on determination. Every day I wake up understanding that we stand on the shoulders of those who came before us. Douglass is among the many very important scholars that continue to be referenced as our nation and our world strives to be more just, more inclusive, and more humane. The mission of Westchester University is to be a community of educators that develops and graduates students in order to succeed personally and professionally and contribute to the common good. A person can't do that with blinders on. Understanding, valuing, and advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion is essential to realizing that goal. This lecture series would not be made possible without the generous support of Dr. Clifford E. D. Baptiste. At this time, please join me in recognizing Lillian D. Baptiste and members of the D. Baptiste family. In addition, our diversity speaker series is brought to you through the generous support of our sponsors, Truist, Essential Utilities, and West Pharmaceuticals. At this time, I'd like to have Andrea Young introduce WCU's Gospel Ministries, who will perform Lift Every Voice and Sing. Good afternoon, Westchester community. How are we today? Yes, there you go. Let me hear a little bit of noise from you this afternoon. All right, <laughs> let's get excited. So, um, I won't stay before you long, but I wanted to just give you a little bit of history about Westchester University Gospel Ministries. So they started out as Westchester Gospel Choir in 1970. Okay, and they just were a small group of students who just wanted to bring a taste of home to their college experience. And I'm sure we can all relate to that, right? So, however, over the years, they began to grow in various ways. 
and there were more additions to the choir. And so eventually they became what we know today as Westchester University Gospel Ministries. So whether you know it or not, they do many things. They aren't just a choir, they have dance ministries as well. So with us today is a small ensemble from the ministry. And without further ado, it gives me the greatest pleasure to bring before you to introduce and to present Westchester University Gospel Ministries. Lift every voice and sing to earth in heaven ring, ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing. has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun, let us march on till victory. Stony the road we try, bitter the chastening rod, felt in the days when hope unborn had died. Yet with a steady beat, have not our weary feet come to the place for which our fathers sigh. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun day begun. Let us march on till victory is won. Dr. Jim Trotman, who will serve as our Master of Ceremonies. Jim Trotman is Professor Emeritus of English and Founding Director of the Frederick Douglass Institute here at Westchester University. He also served as the first convener of the Frederick Douglass Institute of all 14 campuses of Pennsylvania's system of higher education. He earned his undergraduate and master's degrees from Penn State University and doctor doctorate from Teachers College, Columbia University. Well published, well known, and definitely a leader in our community. He asked me to be brief. Um, please, without further ado, join me in welcoming Dr. Jim Trotman. Uh, I'd like you to join me in giving a round of applause to Dr. Robinson. If the character of our lives is better today, it's because of the enormous work and sensitivity that Dr. Robinson brings to her task. Let me begin by saying when you came to campus today, you crossed a threshold, a threshold in which 
the campus is celebrating its sesquicentennial. And in that 150 year anniversary today, we are reawakening the spirit of this school's early leadership. I would remind you that in 1871, the nation was still in deep turmoil. The Civil War was not yet out of people's minds, yet within a generation of the birth of Westchester Teachers College, the principal, George Morris Phillips, found it within his spirit to invite the most abolitionists of all abolitionists in his time to come and to speak to the students at Westchester Teachers College. In, in, in uh, February 1 of 1895. The point to be made in these brief introductory remarks is that the statue to my left and in front of you is a part of Westchester's destiny. It is part of our fate to use Douglas's life as an example for our students so that they might struggle and discover victory out of that struggle. But let me just uh, pause in a, in a moment to say to you that uh, without uh, the president's leadership, President Fiorentino, this would not have happened. And especially without the support and encouragement of Dr. Clifford E. D. Baptiste, there would be no Douglas Institute. Without Dr. D. Baptiste, there would be no statue. Without Dr. D. Baptiste, there would be no Douglas Collaborative at the other 13 campuses in our state system. He is an enormous voice and an enormous contributor. He is indeed our patron. And so while he's not able to be here today, our love goes out to him and his family for the support and encouragement that he has brought to this campus. Yes. Get that one on film. I think also it's important for you to know that the leadership of the Douglas Institute is in wonderful hands. And while I'm talking about that, I want Dr. Chris Awuya to come forward, if you will, please. There may, while, while he's coming, there may, I want you to know that there may be many ways of looking at Douglas. But nothing is com more compelling to our students than to understand that Frederick Douglass is a model for learning, for listening, and for finding purpose in your life. But I'm not going to say too much more about that because I'm sure that Dr. Croft, the preeminent theologian in our midst, will be able to talk to you uh, in greater detail about the significance of Douglas. But I do want this community, community to know about Dr. Chris Awuya. Dr. Chris was my sidekick and is now the di director of the Douglas Institute. This is called the Frederick Douglass Institute because of Dr. Chris's insistence that we not add on any more adjectives to Douglas's name. That's right. He deserves an applause. He is professor of English and comparative literature in the English department. He is not only a published scholar, but he is also a devoted family man with three sons, one of whom is a graduate of Westchester University. I want you to join me in saluting him 
for the work that he continues to keep the Douglas legacy in front of us. Dr. Chris. I also uh, want to make one other, uh, one other point uh, before we, we have a, a moment of peace and prayer. And that is, without you, the name of Douglas is no more than just a statue. Take him home to your young people, to your children, to your, and with some of you, to your grandchildren. I know that I do. And not only read about him, but talk about him, particularly at a time when so much is both taking place in our urban centers, when we still have the memories of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and so forth taking place. And then we have the extraordinary development of space flight, all taking place at the same time. So we have much work to do and much to be thankful for. So please join me in a moment of prayer. Eternal God, we thank you for this opportunity to come before you and to ask you once again to bless us with your grace and your mercy. Give us strength where we are weak. Give us opportunity where we seek choices. Give us power as we feel powerless. Most of all, give us today the opportunity to improve our world. And we ask you to bless us, and we will always remember to give you the honor, the glory, and the praise for what you do in our life. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. thank you very much. For those of you that I don't know, and there could be some in here, I am Jim Trotman, and um, I've been asked to be the master of ceremonies for this, and I'm going to be move this thing along as quickly as I can. But I must confess that I haven't been to the podium in about 10 years. <laughs> And so, once you get an old car moving, it gets to be a little difficult. But now let me turn the agenda over to my friend and colleague and to a wonderful human being who brings the citizenship of the world to Westchester, Dr. Chris, Dr. Chris Awood. Thank you, Dr. Trotsman. Uh, I would rather uh, be in the audience and uh, have you go on and on. Um, but for protocol, uh, I have to say that uh, last night I made a, a phone call, a brief phone call to Dr. Trotsman, and uh, when he responded, he called me by my middle name, Kwame. I was there with my son, and uh, my son asked me, why didn't he call you by your first name rather, by, rather than your middle name? And uh, we both paused for a while, and then I told him that there are people who, along your life journey, there are people who have stood by you moments of great sadness, sorrow, moments of great happiness. And I said real human beings have moved beyond friends to become brothers. And therefore, Dr. Trotman, I still call him Dr. Trotman, uh, is my brother and most deserving to call me by my middle name. When I first came to Westchester, 30 years plus, he was the first person I met, and we
we spoke in uh, Mirror Talks. Eventually, he brought me to the campus and met other members of the team. And uh, within a day or two, I knew I had found a home. And over a year or so, I knew I have also found a brother. And that has been the case well over 30 years. In, the in 1990, when Nelson Mandela was uh, free from prison, 94, when he became president of South Africa, we were giddy, so happy. It was at that moment when our students, students from Dr. Trotman's class, made us aware of the historic visit to Westchester by uh, Freddie Douglas. And so, with that discovery, under the leadership of Dr. Dr. Trotman, he made us aware that this is a responsibility, responsibility beyond an individual, beyond an institution, beyond you know, the regional level. And so, he beckoned people from all over the nation to think carefully about that sense of respons responsibility. There were trips that we took to the home of Fred Douglas at Cedar Hill to know Douglas the man, to know his soul, to understand his values, his family values, his civil rights activism, and his stand, unyielding stand for social justice. Through those times, as we listened to Dr. Trotman, we became aware that service, service to community, to students, was a calling that came with grace. And, and so he built, right on this campus, a sense of and a desire to belong to the Douglas Institute. And that carried over into the state system across. Uh, today, we have Freddie Douglas Institute. We understand that when you plant a tree and that tree grows, it is necessary for the tree to have deep roots. And that those deep roots will withstand any storm. Over the last couple of years, even with the pandemic, the Douglas Institute has stood very strong. We today have well over 30 faculty members and staff who take leadership position in all realms, all activities. And ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to note that uh, these activities are done on volunteer basis. And that many, many faculty students devote inordinate amount of time in the service of, of uh, Douglas. Without taking too much of your time, I want to note that uh, at the Coastville Area School District, over the last six years, we have served well over 3,000 students. Students in the fifth grade, we served students in the 10th and 11th grade we have, we have common reader for them. We work with their teachers. And uh, with the 10th and 11th grade, our tutors go over and uh, work with these students, preparing them from standardized tests, helping them with homework. And this has been regular activity we do every Tuesday and every Wednesday. During the pandemic, as we have now, we have migrated to online, and we still persist in those activities. We have been able to go to the Norristown School District, and we have engaged you know, students, students of color, students with challenging family circumstances. This has, not, this has been a, a, a labor of call because Many of us see ourselves in those students. They are where we were at one time. And so that commitment is to make them assume where we are now. And, they have, and that has worked very well. We have plans to begin work with uh, Finisville School District. And this is what 
has driven the Douglas Institute over the last few years. We are also active on campus in engaging the campus with stimulating, challenging, you know, topics of discussions. The last couple of years, we've had what we call courageous uh, conversations on matters about voting, policing, and so forth and so on. We have had uh, um, discussions led by one Dr. Khalid Mohammed, who says that diversity is not enough, bias education as, uh, is a social vaccine. So these are activities of the Freddie Douglas Institute. And uh, with the 150th year of the campus, the Douglas Institute is very well positioned to take an active part uh, in it. Um, at this point, I would like to introduce uh, to you uh, the board chairperson, Dr. Francis Etuahini. Uh, he has you know, led the board um, with so much creativity and uh, most often uh, he's engaging and, and uh, has provided, you know, leadership, you know, to the institute as a whole. Uh, Dr. Fra Etuahini is the director of uh, Exploratory Studies Academic Division. Uh, he's a faculty member of uh, Public Policy and Administration, and currently is the recording secretary of uh, CAPSI. Uh, please give Dr. Etuahini a big hand uh, many of the things, activities of the Institute uh, have been made possible because of his leadership. Um, so please, uh, let's commend him for... <laughs> but before he introduces our speaker for this evening, I would like to introduce, you know, for in a special you know, performance by Orville Brissett, um, Minister of Music at St. Paul's Baptist, uh, who will give us uh, a special song. And then Dr. Etuahini will introduce our speaker for today. Thank you. Thank you. 
to carry me home. I'll cut a hole and pull you through, coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. But if you get there before I
strategics at Harvard Theological Seminary of Eastern University in Philadelphia, and now serves as the Jeremiah A. Wright Senior Associate Professor of Homiletics and Liturgies in African American Studies at Lutheran Theological Seminary at Philadelphia. Dr. Croft Sr. has distinguished himself as a pastor, writer, and scholar, having earned an associate degree from Pinebrook Junior College and graduated magna cum laude from Trinity College, earning a Bachelor of Arts. He received the Master of Divinity degree from Eastern Baptist Theological Seminary, now Parma Theological Seminary, Master of Theology degree from Princeton Theological Seminary, and graduated with distinction from Drew University in Madison, New Jersey, earning a Doctor of Ministry degree. He also earned a Master of Philosophy and Doctor of Philosophy degree from Drew. He is the first person to earn both a Doctor of Ministry and Doctor of Philosophy from Drew University. Dr. Croft Sr. is married to Dr. Lisa L. Croft, a family physician, and they have three children, Darlene William, an attorney in Charlotte, North Carolina, Wayne Jr., a recent graduate of Morehouse College in Atlanta, Candice Nicole, a student at Spearman College, Atlanta, and granddaughter Patterson. Ladies and gentlemen, please let's welcome Dr. Croft Sr. to the stage. University uh, president and the board and all of those who um, have made this possible. I want to thank uh, Dr. Tracy Robinson for her patience, her diligence, and her hospitality. Um, and thank you for being here. Um, I want to also thank what I see are the members of St. Paul's Baptist Church where they allow me to practice pastoring on them. I thank God for them. I want to thank Dr. Clifford E. D. Baptiste for his leadership and, and his, I want to say friendship, but I feel like our relationship has much more depth than that. Um, he has left an indelible impression on my life. So I thank him. Thank you, Lily and Tom, um, for being here. I want to thank my wife who I was sitting next to, um, and my son, Wayne Jr., um, for being as well, Minister of Music, and all of you. Dr. Trotman, thank you for your leadership as well. Permit me to establish some clarifications. First, in this lecture, I will use the term Black and African American to refer to people of African descent. When I use these terms, I am referring to a descendant of relative handful of black colonial indentured servants and the estimated 10 to 12 million Africans who arrived in the United States and were enslaved. Although the term African American remains a popular term today, there's also remains a preference for the term black, which I will also use. Second, in using the term African American or black church, I speak of a church which is predominantly made up of people who are of African descent and whose worship style displays certain characteristics. Finally, I believe in the use of inclusive language, and we'll use it throughout this lecture. There are, however, some authors whom I have chosen to quote whose language is exclusive, and their quotes will remain as they are without any reflection on the lecture. <laughs> Frederick Douglass, a prophet of hope by the rivers of Babylon. In 1962, Rabbi Abraham Heschel 
a Jewish theologian and social activist, released his profound book titled, The Prophets. According to Heschel, the experience of the prophets in scripture is not one of receiving information from God about the future. Instead, a prophet is someone swept up in what Heschel called the divine pathos, God's passion for justice and peace upon the earth. Most people are aware that Frederick Douglass was an abolitionist, orator, lecturer, editor, author, U.S. Marshal, record of de rec recorder of deeds, and U.S. minister to Haiti. Yet there remains those who are unaware of the fact that he was also a licensed preacher. Douglass was born Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey, a slave in Talbot County, Maryland, in February 1818. His actual birth date is unknown, however, he chose to commemorate his birthday on February 14th. Though Frederick was born in slavery, he would escape enslavement at age 20. He lived 20 years as a slave and nearly nine years as a fugitive slave, subject to recapture. Many locals, black and white, were willing for money to tell the authorities about people trying to escape enslavement for his own protection. Frederick changed his name from Frederick Bailey to Frederick Johnson. When Frederick arrived in New York, black abolitionist David Ruggles encouraged him to leave New York City for New Bedford, Massachusetts. Ruggles had determined that New Bedford's shipping industry would offer Frederick the best chance to find work as a ship caulker. Because many families in New Bedford had the surname Johnson, Frederick chose to change his name again. Nathan Johnson, a local black man, Frederick and his wife stayed with in New Bedford, suggested Frederick change his last name from Frederick Johnson to Frederick Douglass, which was inspired by the name of an exiled nobleman named Douglass in Sir Walter's poem, The Lady of the Lake. This Douglass spelled his name with one X. On September 17, 1838, Frederick changed his name, his last name to Douglass. He liked the name sound and strength, and he added another S at the end of Douglas for distinction. Before he left Maryland, Douglas was a member of a Methodist church in Baltimore. When he arrived in New Bedford, Massachusetts, he attended Elm Street Methodist Church and was immediately assigned to a Jim Crow gallery. He was willing to bear this humiliation until he learned that all the white members would be allowed to go to the communion table before any of the black people. He also learned that the church did not uphold the anti-slavery tenet, which Douglas knew to be central to the denomination. Douglas withdrew from Elm Street and became a member of Little Zion, a church affiliated with the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church, as early as 1839. When he was only 22 years old, Douglas was licensed to preach by the quarterly conference of the AME Zion Church. As an ordained minister in the AME Zion Church, Douglas joined the battle against the American Colonization Society and their hatred towards people of African descent. Published just weeks after his death on February 20th, 1985, Douglas wrote Bishop James Walker Hood these words. I look back to the days I spent in Little Zion, New Bedford, in the several capacities of sexton, steward, class leader, clerk, and local preacher as among the happiest days of my life. As early as 1839, I obtained a license from the quarterly conference as a local preacher and often occupied the pulpit by request of the preacher in charge. No doubt that the exercise of my gifts in this vocation helped to prepare me for the widest sphere of usefulness which I have since occupied. I was from this Zion church that I went forth to work of delivering my brethren from bondage. See James Trotman, Professor Emeritus of English and founding director of the Douglas Institute here at Westchester and who you have met, and his biographical work of Frederick Douglass highlights the spiritual dimensions of Douglass's life. He analyzed Douglass's life, excavating evidence to show how Douglass's spirituality was, essential, was an essential part of his restless soul searching for truth and freedom. Trotman concluded stating, Douglass had faith in God, in the divine, and he was a Christian. If you don't believe he said that, he's sitting right back there. <laughs> History cannot separate Douglas' work from his faith.
In fact, a church in Elmira, New York, was and is named Frederick Douglass AME Zion Church. The website, its website notes that the church was inspired by an 1840 anti-slavery lecture by Douglass. Benjamin E. Park states that one of the first jobs for which Frederick Douglass was ever paid before editing his first of many newspapers and before taking his first of many government positions was that of a preacher. Yes, Frederick Douglass was a preacher and he was a prophet in the black church. The black church in which Douglass spoke is the only institution birthed from slavery, nurtured in the bosom of social protest, and still thrives in its, in its existence as a caretaker of the human soul. Charles Gilchrist Adams refers to the black church as the fulcrum, fulcrum of human hope. The black church is the nucleus of human life, the preserver of culture, the producer of genius, the power base of of advocacy and politics. It is the parent of black music and art, the incubator and the production of new leaders, the storehouse for the disinherited, the launching pad for social action, and the hospital for wounded souls. It was within the black church that Douglas' life was shaped. To be a black preacher in the black church, particularly a church that is socially conscious, or in today's vernacular, woke, one is expected to hold the title prophet. The tragedy today is, is that we got preachers who spell prophet P-R-O-F-I-T instead of P-R-O-P-H-E-T. Frederick Douglass was a preacher and a prophet. In 1862, he declared, there is a prophet within us forever whispering that behind the scene lies the immeasurable unseen. Douglass' statue as a prophet is affirmed by various prominent authors, D.H. Dilbeck titled his book on Douglas, Frederick Douglass, America's Prophet. Dilbeck gives a provocative interpretation of Douglass's life through the lens of his faith. He describes Douglas as a type of John the Baptist as he refers to Douglas as a prophet crying in the wilderness of Christian slaveholding America. Dilbeck believed Doug Douglas also nurtured his faith, but he nurtured his faith in tension, the tension between his assurance of the truth of Christianity and his frustration with how most Americans practice it. But Dilbeck Douglas never resolved that tension, but it gave meaning to his faith and to how his Christian convictions would inform his activism. It is for that reason D.H. Dilbeck titled his book as well as referred to Douglas as America's Prophet. David Blight's extraordinary biography, biography titled Frederick Douglass, Prophet of Freedom, profoundly and distinctively, he illuminates Douglass's life. He illuminates Douglass's proclivity to think deeply about theology and the biblical story. When Blight decided to write this full biography of Douglass, he chose to refer to Douglass as a prophet, a prophet of freedom. Blight writes, Douglass was a living prophet. Jeremiah and Isaiah, as well as other prophets, were his guides. They gave him story, metaphor, resolve, and ancient wisdom in order to deliver his ferocious critique of slavery and his country before emancipation and then his strained but hopeful narrative of his future after 1865. Blight goes on to say, it's easy to call Douglas a prophet. For D.H. Dilbeck, Douglas was America's prophet. For David Blight, Douglas was the prophet of freedom. Distinguishing Frederick Douglass as a prophet is more than befitting. Douglass spoke truth to power by using his oratory and, and writing skills to communicate his desire to free enslaved Africans. He dedicated his life to both the cause of abolition and of women's rights. He also advocated for the inclusion of black soldiers in the U Union Army. Douglas's life and work exemplify the struggle of being black in America. As Douglas famously proclaimed, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. Yes, it's easy to call, to refer to, or acknowledge Frederick Douglass as prophet. However, this begs me to raise a question. What does it really mean to be a prophet? The term carries a multitude of meanings, both spiritual and secular. In some contexts, it implies a sense of religious fanaticism or, at the very best, charisma and suggests an individual with a close relationship to the divine. To be a prophet.
prophet is to carry out a predictive role. Prophet speaks of cause and effect, but their predictions of impending doom were not like a scientist's prediction of what will happen. Prophets are not fortune tellers, they are foretellers. In the popular imagination, at least, the prophet is typically seen as someone standing outside of society and declaring its wickedness. The prophet is human, wrote Abraham Heschel, yet he employs notes one octave too high for our ears. He experiences moments that defy our understanding. He is neither a singing saint nor a moralizing poet, but an assaulter of the mind. Often his words begin to burn where conscience ends. As one who awakened America's conscience to the evils of slavery and racial oppression, boldly denounced the oppressive and racist actions of southern states, challenged northern compromises and pro-slavery churches with righteous indignation, Frederick Douglass was a prophet. The prophecy of a coming judgment day figures prominently in Douglass's writing. He warned the nation to turn from its wicked ways before it was too late. Frederick Douglass had within him an abolitionist sacred agitation he followed in the path of the Old Testament prophets crying out for justice. He cherished the words of the prophet Isaiah and the, and the gospel of Jesus Christ as evidenced by frequent citations both in his speeches and writings. David Blight states that the Old Testament prophets helped make Douglas a great ironist, a great storyteller that fueled his growing militancy and brought pathos and thunder to his voice as they also shaped his view of history itself. Douglas not only used the Hebrew prophets, he joined them. In 1852, the Rochester Ladies Anti-Slavery Society asked Douglas to deliver a 4th of July address. Although he accepted the invitation to speak, he insisted that, the deliver, that he deliver his address on July 5th. Douglas is believed to have made this request both because this had become a regular practice in New York's black community and perhaps in part because slave auctions had often been held on July 4th. The 4th also fell on a Sunday and some believe for that reason the Rochesterites moved it to Monday. That day, the, the Douglas delivered what would become his most famous and memorable speech. What to the slave is the 4th of July, a speech that continues to resonate and burn with his spirit. Douglas worked diligently on his speech three weeks in advance. Nearly 600 people packed into the newly constructed Corinthian Hall in Rochester, New York for this event. He delivered a escaping attack on the hypocrisy of a nation celebrating freedom and independence with speeches, parades, and platitudes while within its borders nearly four million humans were being kept as slaves. He passionately articulated to the crowd that this celebration is yours, not mine. You may rejoice, I must mourn. And then somewhere around the fourth paragraph of his speech parallels the captivity of the ancient Jews as he reads Psalms 137 that says, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song, and they who wasted us required us of mirth, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. This psalm Douglas included in his speech was for Douglas a culminating articulation that decries the social, political, and economic structures of the United States that suppress and objectify the dignity of black humanity. Psalms 137 is the only psalm of 150 psalms to be set in a particular time and place. It relates to the Babylonian exile, a period in Israel's history when Jews were taken captive in Babylon and the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed. God's people were captive, strangers and exiles in, in the foreign land of Babylon, Babylon where secret mysteries took form and false religion spread over the face of the world. Babylon, the place the 4th century North African bishop St. Augustine referred to as the symbol of evil. The ancient Hebrews found themselves in Babylon, not as willing tourists, but as the unwilling spoils of battle. In a symbolic gesture, they hung their harps 
on weeping willows to display their grief and sorrow. And it is against this background that we must interpret the Babylonian captivity, the release of the captives, and the rebuilding of the temple, and of course, hear the alter alternating warnings, pleadings, and consoling voices of God delivered through the prophets. Here, Douglas, the American bondman, is the suffering ancient Hebrew. He is the lamenting psalmist expressing the black community's sorrow by the rivers of Babylon. Just as the ancient Israelites in, in exile and bondage have been called upon the scene for the Babylonian, their Babylonian captors, so did, so did Douglas feel coerced into performing on the 4th of July for the captors and oppressors of his people. Douglas would not sing any song on the nation's birthday when millions were enslaved. Instead, he recrafted Jeremiah's tales of God's wrath and the people's mourning as he proclaimed, Above your national tumultuous joy, I hear the mournful wail of millions, whose chains, heavy and grievous, yesterday are today, rendered more intolerable by the jubilee shouts that reach them. Douglas carried the burden to speak a word of truth about America in the fashion of the prophets. Ancient Hebrews stood apart from institutions of political and religious power and called them to account for their hypocrisy, as well as their oppression. In his three narratives and his numerous articles, speech, and letters, Douglas never ceased to call America to account for its hypocrisy and acceptance of slavery. In his own words, he proclaimed, Fellow citizens, I will not enlarge further on your national inconsistencies. The existence of slavery in this country brands your republicanism as a sham, your humanity as a base pretense, and your Christianity as a lie. It destroys your moral power abroad. It corrupts your politicians at home. It saps the foundation of religion. It makes your name a hissing and a byword to a mocking earth. It is the antagonistic force, of, in, force in your government. The only thing that seriously disturbs and endangers your union, it fetters your progress. It is the enemy of improvement, shelters crime. It is a curse to the earth that supports it. And yet you cling to it as if it were the sheer anchor of all your hopes. Oh, be warned, be warned, oh horrible reptile is coiled up in your nation's bosom. The venomous creature is nursing at the tender breast of your youthful Republican. Republic, for the love of God, tear away and flee from you the hideous monster and let the weight of 20 millions crush and destroy it forever. Douglas's first-hand knowledge and experience of the suffering of slaves would never allow him to set anything but freedom for those still held in slavery. He per personally experienced suffering and evil at the hands of an enslaver like Edward Covey, whose role was to break human beings. In his first autobiography, Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, an American Slave, Douglass tells how, as a teenager, when he arrived on Edward Covey's plantation on January 1st, 1833, he experienced Covey's brutality within the first week. Douglas's inability to go into a forest and retrieve wood and manage Covey's oxen upset Covey. Covey ordered Douglas to return to the woods and followed him. When they arrived in the woods, Covey cut three large branches, and after trimming them with his pocket knife, knife he ordered Douglas to take off his clothes. Douglas refused. Covey rushed at him, tore off Douglas' clothes, and began beating Douglas until he had worn out his switches. Douglas said, Covey gave me a, a very whipping, cutting my back, causing, causing the blood to run, and raising ridges on my flesh as large as my little finger. Covey does not whip the unbroken oxen, an implicit acknowledgment that something must be beaten out of Douglas, namely his humanity. But Douglas knew firsthand about the plight and suffering of blacks. Throughout the ages, black Christians have been faced with an unavoidable question, a question that black theologians such as James Cone, Gerard Wilmore, Katie Cannon, J.D. Otis Roberts, and countless others have wrestled with. And that question is, if God is good, why did God permit millions of people of African descent to be stolen from Mother Africa, perish in the Middle Passage, and be enslaved in a strange land? If God is good, 
Why did God permit millions of people of African descent to be stolen from Mother Africa, Africa, perish in the Middle Passage, and be enslaved in a strange land? No black person has been able to escape the existential and profound agony of that question. How do black Christians like Douglas explain their faith in God as our liberator when black people have been oppressed for more than three centuries and have been crying out with the psalmist, how long, O oh Lord, how long? Black churches and preachers seem to have no meaningful answer to this question. We simply repeat religious cliches like, all things work together for the good. We'll understand it better by and by. Or God is good all the time. And these words are true, but they do not reach down far enough into the pain of the spouse who lost their partner after 50 years of marriage, or the mother or grandmother who lost their child too soon or to senseless violence, or the person who is losing their battle with cancer. There is no easy answer to this theological problem in question, no easy way to deal with the injustice and sufferings in life. We must reflect and wrestle and probe the depth of our faith and our effort to deepen it because an uncritical faith cannot sustain us through a life filled with trouble. How do we explain serving a benevolent God who allows suffering? I don't have an easy answer to this question, but I think I have a theological one. First, we must ask, what would humanity be if God did not allow suffering? The answer would be much less free than we are. To, be, to prevent suffering, God would have to remove from us our ability to make choices. And God would have to take away our ability to make anything but the very best choice. The joy of my faith and the faith of a Frederick Douglass and many others is that God does not twist our arm to do what God wants, but gives us freedom of choice. God creates humankind with freedom. The suggestion that God could have made us free and guaranteed that we never misuse our freedom is not possible because it would deny us the freedom of making our own choices. Since we are created with freedom, we are accountable for moral evil which is incurred by wrongful choice. Consider this, much of the evil and suffering in the world is related to the wickedness of humankind. God and God's wisdom allows us to make wrongful choice, but also since God is holy and righteous, God must punish sin and evil doings. Therefore, the presence of evil in the world is not God's fault. Humankind is responsible and accountable for the presence of pains and suffering that are inflicting humanity today simply because we made some bad choices. We can know good from evil and make choices in one direction or the other. We must come to the difficult understanding that a world without suffering would be a world without a humanity free to choose between good and evil. There is suffering in the world, not simply because God permits it, but because there are evil people in the world who distort the good God has given and misinterpret scripture to oppress other people. It's up to good and moral people to dismantle the evil and suffering that evil and moral people perpetuate. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men and women to do nothing. A quote routinely attributed to Edmund Burke. For African-American Christians, we know that suffering challenges our faith and often causes us to doubt and question faith's credibility and its authenticity in a world of trouble and sorrow. On the other hand, faith rightfully challenges suffering, refusing to let evil and suffering have the last word. In his book, God of the Oppressed, the father of black theology, James Cone states, there is the experience of suffering in the world and no amount a theological argument can explain the way of pain of our suffering in a racist society. But in the experience of the cross and resurrection, we know not only that black suffering is wrong, but that it has been overcome in Jesus Christ. Our faith in Jesus' victory over suffering is a once for all event liberation. Now this may not satisfy those who are looking for a philosophical or rational answer. However, Jesus for Douglas and black Christians and Christians all over the world was not and is not a clever theological device to escape the difficulties inherent in suffering. 
Jesus was and is the one who lives with us in suffering and gives us courage and strength to hold out to the end, to fight for justice in the face of injustice, and to walk together children and never get weary. I do not subscribe to, Je to the Jesus portrayed on sentimental Christmas cards and other places as the mild manner and weak man. Don't forget that the Prince of Peace turned over tables in a marketplace of greed, shared meals with unclean people, touched those others would not touch, challenged those in, a, in power, and wept with grieving women. We take our cues from Jesus. Jesus, a marginalized Jew born from the womb of a lowly peasant woman who challenged the political establishment and challenged and championed the cause of the poor and disinherited and declared liberation for those who were oppressed under the tyranny of a Roman empire. Jesus, who was despised, rejected, bruised, oppressed, afflicted, wounded, and was led to the slaughter. Jesus, who, like my ancestors, was lynched on a tree and died on the backside of a hill, but who reappeared after being buried claiming victory over sin, death, and the grave, and claimed that all could be united in, ne in a network of co cooperation, and all could have peace and justice, freedom and dignity under the sovereignty of God who had sent him to preach the good news. Douglas, Douglas was not only America's prophet, and he was not solely the prophet of freedom. Finally, Douglas was a prophet of hope. The author of the seminal book, The Prophetic Imagination, Walter Brueggemann, suggests that the prophet should not only criticize social and spiritual, spiritual shortcomings, but also energize people with the hope that alternatives are possible. God's hope, our hope, can work against the data. Prophetic ministry seeks to penetrate despair so that new futures can be believed and, and, and embraced by us. It is the task of the prophet and people to bring to expression the new realities against the more visible ones of the old order. Energizing is closely linked to hope. Part three of D.H. Dilbeck's book titled The Hopeful Prophet, Dilbeck sheds light on how Douglas balanced hope and despair during the tumult of the Civil War and in his post-war suffrage activism. He held fast to a distinctly Christian hope. Dilbeck said that Douglas had a hope that revived his soul with the assurance that American slavery would not long endure. Dilbeck concluded saying of Douglas, he yearned to see the United States redeemed from its bigotry and hypocrisy, not destroyed for it. He forever bore slavery scars, a bitter reminder of Americans' capacity for oppression, but he did not bear the scars as one who had no hope. Hope. Hope is that which inspired, which inspired, which is inspired because of a righteous anger at injustice and has the courage to show the world that things need not remain the same. We are called to be prophets amid hopeless situations. We must remember that hope is not a utopian future unrelated to the inexplicable changes of the past and the ambiguities of the present. Hope is a future in which God redeems history, establishes justice, and brings peace. However, hope comes with some pain. The late Nelson Mandela, Mandela's op opposition to apartheid landed him in prison for 27 years. In my country, Mandela said, we go to prison first and then become president. You see, you see, hope is not wholeness unacquainted with brokenness. No, it is brokenness made whole by grace and hope. Authentic hope is always paradoxical as it bears the marks of prior wounding and walks into the future on legs once paralyzed by fear. We need prophets in America. We need prophets of freedom. We need prophets of hope. And we need prophets by the rivers of Babylon to let those who oppress know that we refuse to sing while the oppressed discriminate, those that, that are being discriminated against and those who are being marginalized sit by the side in our burden. Prophets who are aware that being a prophet is risky business. It put the prophet Elijah in a cave. It threw, it threw the prophet Jeremiah in a pit. It caused John the Baptist to be beheaded. It had Bishop Polycarp of Smyrna burned alive. It caused Martin Luther to be excommunicated in Germany. It placed Ida B. Wells' life in constant danger. It was the reason Oscar Romero was murdered. Rosa Parks was arrested. Martin Luther King Jr. assassinated. Frederick Douglass criticized, and it put Jesus on the cross. 
the true prophetic spirit of Frederick Douglass today must address the conditions of injustice. Thus, we need prophets like Frederick Douglass by the rivers of Babylon with a pandemic that has caused more than 680,000 deaths in the United States. We need prophets, men and women fearlessly standing in the gap, compelled to speak truth to power with approximately 227 people murdered in 2020 for protecting the environment and lands right for indigenous people, we need profits. With damaged homes, more than 2,000 lives lost, and lives changed forever in Haiti, we need profits. With proponents of systematic racism in America still to this very day overtly and covertly stoking its fires while hiding behind the mask of a created nationalism designed to halt movement toward that perfect union, we need profits in a country that will rescue and protect one group, but return Haitians to Haiti under a U.S. policy known as Title 42, which singles out asylum seekers crossing into the United States at land, at land borders, particularly from Central America, Africa, and Haiti, who are disproportionately black, ind indigenous, and Latino for expulsion. We need profits. We need prophets and prophetess who, like Frederick Douglass, sat down by the rivers of Babylon only to rise up and bring hope to those who have lost hope, lest our feet stray from the places our God where we met thee, lest our hearts drunk with the wine of the world we forget thee, shadow beneath thy hand. May we forever stand true to our God, true to our native land. not sure about all of you, but I know where I'm going to church this Sunday. That, that was an inspiring and a stimulating speech from which all of us can learn more about the Prophet Douglas, about ourselves and what we can do. If you are uh, going to be around this weekend, let me encourage you to come Saturday to Sykes Student Union Building in the theater where the great-great-granddaughter of Douglas will be here as a part of the university's program entitled Insight. Nettie Washington Douglas bears two family symbols, names, that are absolutely essential to understanding American life. Not only is she the great-great-granddaughter of him, but she is also the great-granddaughter of Booker T. Washington. This will be her third trip to Westchester, the first two were intended to uh, expose her to what we were doing with the Douglas Institute. And the second one was to move her specifically into a closer relationship with teachers and professors at all levels. So let me just first of all thank the Reverend Dr. Croft for that very stimulating speech keeping alive this lecture tradition. And then secondly, to thank you for coming and urge you to come back Saturday at, did she have three fingers, okay. <laughs> Saturday at three o'clock in Sykes Union Building in the theater where you can hear 
something that's really very critical. Most of us don't even know our grandparents, much less our great-great-grandparents. And so she will be able to uh, open uh, some spiritual doors to the meaning of legacy, not only in her life, but as it transfers to our own. Right now, genealogy is a hot topic, both academically and socially. And Nettie Washington Douglas is in a position to carry this on. In closing, I'm sure Dr. Croft would be more than happy to share a few words with you. And he'll also look forward to seeing you on Sunday. So thank you all very much for coming. Where's Dr. Robinson? Where is she? Is there anything else I should add? Okay, we've all been pandemically careful. There's water in the back for you to nourish yourself and of course to mix with each other and to say hello if you see a face that you don't see. Thank you so very much for coming.